and our miners should be along momentarily to start work on the trench. Yes, I did. That's actually a filter. Basically, the wagons will all take the long route. Hostile invaders will come through the narrow gap. The narrow gap is going to feed right into a trap corridor, basically. It also provides a convenient way for dwarves who are going to the outer world, if you will, to get out of the fortress quickly, so they're not weaving in and out of the uh, long path. And again, we're really just starved for dwarven labor. And we need to revise our military now. All these folks who are mine workers need to be relieved from the military. No, the, the fat corridor is for the caravan, which can't cross traps unless that's been changed in version 40. Um, still not entirely clear whether the wagon being able to trundle over traps in 3125, whether that was a bug in 34, or whether it was just a bug in... or whether it was intended behavior. My guess is intended behavior because Toadie didn't fix it going into version 40, but... I would think that would be relatively simple. But our miners will come along and excavate the trench, and then we will go back and remove the ramps. We'll build a bridge that will raise and lower to let things in and out. And we'll designate a setback from the walls, from the... Uh, moat, if you will. No, I can't do it. So, yeah, we're going heavier into defense on our next fort, I can tell you that. I have a siege show up in the first autumn. Unless I went straight for crafts, that's like unheard of. Yeah, but it remains to be seen whether that's going to stay true for all of version 40, i.e. whether it's intended behavior or not. They won't cross any traps. And everybody say, free stuff! Plow! Now the way we keep it up from spoiling is we set a stockpile under everything that's spilled out. And we set its settings to take everything. I don't care what it is. We want every item in the game possible. You set it for maximum barrels and maximum bins, but you only let it take from links and you don't give it any links to take from. And this stockpile will basically hold all the goods until they can be moved into other stockpiles. 
now because we've got all this stuff exposed and we're going to start seeing no doubt thieves in the near future we need to start thinking about dogs and how we're going to handle those so the next thing I do is throw a, a zone up here for pasture space and we'll put all of the dogs into the pasture in order to give them something to do And we'll set this for training as well. Yeah, there may be some job cancellations here as the miners kind of excavate the flooded area. But that'll quickly spread out and fall below the level where it matters. Oh, we forgot to turn on flow levels, so I can't tell how deep the water is without looking. Well, normally I don't plaster my fortress with cage traps. You'll get some weapon traps, but I used a combined arms kind of arrangement. You'll get weapon traps at the outside, usually, with cage traps backing them up, and military behind that with dogs. But we'll get into that later. For right now, I'm just getting a temporary entrance up anyway. So this giant castle where we've built here, this enormous structure, is actually just... A temporary. And yes, that's correct. Traps will not beat everything. That even ignores flyers, which right now could fly over my walls like they didn't exist anyway. Not that it matters because the front door's wide open, but the point's still made. Oh good, more slaves. I mean dwarves. Only four, sadly. And apparently they are scared of that goblin who never left our map for whatever reason. So... Yeah, apparently got stuck right on the pond. That's fantastic. He'll just sit out there forever. Our guys will eventually wander around the goblin. Well, see, you say not the best idea. It was working that way in V31 until in V34 Toadie added minecarts, and then all of a sudden, because he changed the type of building that traps were, and minecarts and traps, track stops and traps all fall under the same category now. And the new category doesn't allow wagons to pass. So it's not sure whether it was, in, I'm not sure whether it was intentional for traps to be caught up in that or not. 
Not that it matters, all it does is complicate your entrance a little bit. Not enough to really worry about. And if you want other sorts of, you know, ambushers and attackers, you can always install Masterwork and go to town there. And they've got a much, much, much broader selection of hostile entities to come and attack your fortress. Now, because we built these walls out of blocks, nothing can climb over them. But if I'd done this in raw stone or wood, then these would all be climbable. They could basically scale our walls as though they weren't there. I was going to say, no way did I use all the siltstone. Yeah, see, that's what the bug was. Basically, if you copied everything from your 4004 folder over to 4005, you would be missing that setting. See, and if you were playing Masterwork and you're modding your game, I'm kind of assuming you're already past the, the sort of basic things I'm teaching. Truly odd behavior like that, I would generally start to suspect something in my inits. Because if you didn't modify your RAWs, if you didn't install a mod or something, that's where I'd look. You could set, now that the way, now that it's been changed, now that the migration wave issue has been fixed, you could set the migration wave, uh, your, your population cap to nothing. And basically you'll get your initial seven. I don't even know if you'll get the old, the first two waves used to be hard coded. You'd always get them no matter what you set your cap to. But I think it's possible in this version, depending on how it's working now, that you can set your, your population cap down to you know, zero, and basically you'd get your initial seven and nothing else. A lot of people have made requests to have, you know, their forts basically be the initial seven with no migrants whatsoever for whatever reason. Maybe they just want to, you know, do a hermit fort, so to speak. And I know that previously the population cap wasn't quite working correctly. So it may not have been that the first two waves were hard-coded, but simply that the population cap wasn't being checked until the first caravan arrived which would have been your spring and summer migration waves and possibly your autumn as well. Let's 
So all this is nice, but you'll have to keep in mind, trees can get broad. So I want to say it's something like a really tall, really old tree can get a little broader than what we're seeing here. You see these branching out, and it doesn't look like these guys are branching out too far. Maybe seven by seven across, so our three-wide ditch basically is enough to keep things from falling inside our fortress. But now the problem is, is that you'll have trees that are growing up near your fortress and things will be able to scale the tree, get on the branches, and then jump across. We don't want that either. So even though we've got, you know, a three-wide ditch setback, if you look at how this tree is growing, theoretically something could scale this and then jump across to our tower. So in addition to cutting away all this soil between the two, we're actually going to have to go back and excavate a little chunk of this and do something around the outer edge of the moat to keep the trees back a little further. Generally, I don't magma flood the surface. Um, you'll get those really hardcore folks who love to go to war with the elves, and that's cool, but uh, frankly, I'd rather see if I can't get myself to import something nice, like a giant war leopard, for example. I can think of all kinds of things that the elves could bring me that I could war train that would be really awesome that aren't going to occur naturally in my fort. Okay, still doing good on food. Let's double check our kitchens and make sure nothing's being cooked or brewed that we don't want to be. Uh, we now have plump helmets and those are marked for cooking by default. I don't cook plants generally because it removes the seeds and I want to have the seeds for replanting. And we're also starting to accumulate some of these uh, odd food items. If I recall correctly, methods for processing some of this stuff may not necessarily be in the game yet, so there will be these are edible, but there are, for example, raw versions of all these that may not be harvestable. Yeah, see, paved roads would be nice, but that's adding a lot of value to the fortress. Um, if V40 works the same as V34, which is an assumption I'm making at the time, it should be possible to cut away what we're cutting and then go around the outside with stockpiles that don't hold anything and basically floor over it that way without having to invest any dwarven labor. Um, that would then prevent the tree growth without having to spend all the resources and time necessary to actually pave around it to start. Downside is we don't get the wood for cutting it back. Upside is we don't have to invest the labor. Okay, now we've got our bridges built, it's designed and ready to go. Down in our dining room, I'm actually going to dig a small complex back this way. And what I like to do is have little niches off my dining room specifically for levers. Get one of these nice, neat little, you know, T-junction kind of rooms. And go back and you can build levers in those niches and it helps distinguish them and keep them separated. Then you can build markers on them so that you can identify them. When DF Hack is installed and working in our current install does not have DF Hack, we'll revisit this concept with access to GUI mechanisms, and I'll basically show you how DF Hack allows us to track not just what a lever is via note, but also what it's linked to. So if you accidentally link something to the wrong things, it will tell you, or if you haven't linked something yet, it will tell you that it doesn't it's not linked. Well, now, keep in mind, with the stockpile thing, I'm assuming, assuming, that it works the same as uh, V34, because that's not a guarantee. I don't know that it works the same as V34. And if it doesn't, then you're going to get um, trees potentially growing through your stockpiles. I've, I've tested it briefly in 4004. Uh, with a trial stockpile that I built inside my walls, and 
I didn't get any tree growth, but I didn't run the fortress for that long. Now, I say that, and I was seeing trees sprout outside the fortress, coming up from saplings, but inside where I had the stockpile built, I got no growth. I got the saplings, but they didn't grow up. So, what I think would, what I think is going to happen here is, inside the fort right now, I'm going to permit tree growth, but I'm going to push it back broadly so that there's a distance between outer trees and inner trees and outer trees in my walls in all cases. And then we'll allow the growth interior and we'll just make sure to keep the trees cut up here on a regular basis. And then when we need to harvest wood, we'll just run out our front door and cut this chunk of forest right here to the ground. But frankly, I'm thinking long term, this is all going to get paved or covered. You know, mostly roads. Probably not going to floor it. I'll probably do roads. And then downstairs below this level of this ditch, we'll dig over and we'll dig out a square area down a few floors, which will become a deep tree farm. Well, you say that, but were you here for the siege that nearly killed us in the first autumn? So I didn't have this all up yet. I mean, I basically had like a corner built, and we get a siege. So future forts, not going to be this pretty. Take a good long look, kids, because that's going away until I'm damn good and ready for it. So we'll go back to the gatehouse model that I've used in the past where we'll have basically a keep that opens up directly into ramps down and then we'll dig everything underground. It'll be a little annoying at first to get um, stuff indoors, so we'll, we'll basically dig the central staircase like we do currently and then we'll floor it over because there's not going to be any surface fortifications in that area and then put the surface fortifications down a tunnel basically that we'll just dig down one level. kind of disappointed because I liked building these castles to defend, but that's okay. It just means that something like this will be a late game build instead of an early game, and we'll just do everything the dwarven way, if you will. Alright, now our setback. The elves are going to love us. Setback is going to have to be at least this in order to allow us room inside the walls. And then as soon as those are downed, I'll start throwing up null stockpiles that don't hold anything. And we need to start putting up traps. I believe I built some spiked ball traps, which aren't particularly effective, but they'll allow us to quickly get something out here. And we confiscated a few other things, which is good. Yeah, see, we don't really... We had one spot that was... I mean, we could have kind of done it right here, but it was a long way from the wagon. We embarked up there. That's a long trek. I don't like hauling things in deep if I don't have to. Now, the problem is, is that the way 40 has changed, I'm going to have to, because it's more... It would be better to get a quick gatehouse or, you know, get stuff underground and then do, like I said, a little gatehouse than it would be to do these kind of surface fortifications. So, like I said, kind of a bummer. Okay, our mine workers need something to do, and it looks like our masons are starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel for things to grind into blocks. 
So let's make sure we've placed all of our dining room furniture that we want. Now, if I recall correctly, what does differ is you'll see that I am getting the cave boss. There's a young tower cap. None of this stuff will grow up, and what I believe will actually happen at some point, I don't know if the fungus continues to grow, so we'll be pasturing up here. But I want to test and see if I can find a few spots under the stockpile that aren't growing and see if they actually sprout fungus. Because if they do, then you can pasture on a stockpile as well, and that'll keep down saplings in indoors, even if it's a uh, an area that would normally permit them. Well, the only difference between... Basically, you'll just dig into the wall and remove some ramps back from that a little bit so that they have to walk around the long way. And then they won't climb down right into your fortress, basically. But even then, you're going to be putting your fortifications back underground, you know, down a tunnel, for example. Yeah, earlier versions, people were saying that dwarves were unnecessarily climbing walls. You'd get them scaling the walls above your volcano. And then, of course, when they slipped up, they'd end up at the bottom of the world. And we'll build our first lever, which will control our first bridge. I'll build a couple of extra levers so I've got some on hand. We don't need to build mechanisms specifically to make extra levers if I need them. And so this is where you get into the problem of, I've got too many levers and I can't run pulls which bridge to do what issue. They're probably alder or something like that. Birch, who knows. Hang on. Um, they are pecan wood. Why pecan wood is yellow, I have no idea. It's just the tile set. At least I assume. It may be that uh, pecan wood is yellow logs and ASCII, too. I don't know. Alright, so now we are going to have our little straight trap corridor where we'll filter the bad guys into. And... It's kind of shielded from our staircase a little bit so that, you know, people at the top of the staircase have a chance to come down before the goblins come swarming in. And we'll do the depot on our side of the wall so that the traders have to basically come around the staircase, the outside of the staircase. 
and that will get us an indoor path for everything to follow. And I say indoor, it's not really indoors, it's you know, not covered by a roof, but it will be indoors safe. Yeah, see, I don't, I didn't think it did. I thought that pecan woods were yellow and. I don't honestly know what color pecan wood's supposed to look like, so. And we'll get some cages built so that we've got something to defend ourselves with. By this point, we should have started to see... Let's check in on our military here. Our military dwarves are all starting to become armored. Now, they're not complete. We may not have had enough bronze to do a full set. But we came pretty close. So, one of our military has a full set of armor, and the other is slightly armored, and then we've got some scattering through the others, and that's about it. That's not limited authority for my channel. That's sufficient authority as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, see, I, I've, I've eaten pecans. I don't know that I've ever actually studied a cross-section of the wood. To be honest, I like pecans. They're delicious. All right, so now we've got our defenses laid out. We've got a sizable quantity of people who are just idling around. So it's time to get our military doing military things. Now, you saw me go into the military earlier, and I kind of rushed through this thinking we were all going to die. And I assigned people into a squad. Created, first, I assigned a militia commander. Then I created a new squad and had people assigned to it. And the reason is because if your militia commander dies, for whatever reason, then you lose the ability to make changes to your roster until you appoint another one. So I'm actually going to keep him out of combat. Uh, I'll probably give him a crossbow and let him train on his own time and not worry about it. And then we'll actually have our military squads basically reporting to him. We won't need the extra recruits in his squad. We will have a sizable military without it. But we got migrants and we didn't do anything about it. And it looks like this guy would be a good fisherman. This guy's a whole lot of nothing here. Still. 
Okay, so you guys just became military dwarves. Congratulations! And then there were four. And our military dwarves will handle animal training so that we can give them something to do that they'll skill up on. Pump operating, because pump operating is build stats, and if they're not doing anything else, pump operation is a perfectly valid thing. And that should get it for now. I'll do hauling as well. Okay, now let's go over to the military screen and... Oh, no wait, let's not. In Dwarf Therapist, I can go through and say, okay, all those new guys I assigned, I can do assign to squad... And I can't actually assign him to a squad, because the only squad I can assign him to is the one that the militia commander runs. And I can check each one of them and say, oh, look, he I added him to the profession, but I didn't add him to the squad. So now I can go over here and add him to the squad. Can't do him because he's already in the squad. And then this guy is now in the squad, too. And when I commit those, now everybody's in the squad. Now I also have some of these haulers that were in the squad. So what we'll do is we'll sort these guys by military status and remove all of get four women. And we've got our women in the military, that's what it was. And Therapist now seems very confused, because we only have four people in that squad. It sees five, so we're going to reboot him. And I could have done that by going to the launcher, but I have old bad habits. And that'll free up the weapons that those haulers were carrying for our real military dwarves to actually carry. Um, they'll have picked up any equipment we have. We've probably run out of equipment at this point. I think we've probably cleared our jobs. Nope, we're still doing it. So our military is going to continue to be equipped as we go. We're going to set up a barracks at the door here. And we'll make it just as large as on the bridge. So that's as large as it's going to be. And we'll set everybody who wants to train to train here. And right now they don't have a schedule, so they'll only come and train if they're idle. They'll go train on their own time. So you'll get dwarves who don't have anything better to do. They'll move into the area and they'll start training. 
looks like he's actually training on the bridge, and I don't want them on the bridge. Nope. Nope, that's too big. I want them inside the walls in case I have to raise the uh, drawbridge. Now, what we've got is a double layered defense where the dogs in the military will help with the kobolds. In the event the goblins come, I can pull the military back beyond traps and hit them with the traps and then hit them with the military. Okay, so your food is going into barrels even though you have a lot of pots. Now my, su my suspicion is dwarves prefer barrels, but don't quote me. I've never actually tested it because once rock pots became available, I pretty much never made a barrel again unless I needed it for a workshop. <laughs> um, the answer in my question is, did you reserve barrels? Because you can go into the stockpile settings and change the reserved barrel count here, which will reserve barrels for jobs if that's your problem. But if you're just talking about the preference to, of barrels to pots, yeah, my suspicion, it, well, it's possible that, like I said, for storage purposes, they will prefer barrels first. I don't know that. You could get around that somewhat by setting a reserved barrel count. If you want to have, for example, drink in barrels as opposed to pots. My guess is that when the dwarves are considering what containers to put it in, they just... The, the code basically checks one before it checks the other. Okay, and so already you can see we've got people... This is our farmer who just happens to be our militia commander. If I want him to be planting more, I can remove him from his schedule, basically. I can basically tell him not to train at the barracks and he'll stop. But for right now, he can get some skill up just like everybody else can. Now we need to talk about schedules. So I've assigned everybody. I, gave, I created a uniform... You saw me build the uniform up from the individual pieces here. You'll notice that my uniforms are partial matches, and there's a reason I want them to upgrade. Uh, we will set materials of all these now, because ideally what I want is my frontline defenders to be in steel or better, and we'll worry about better when we get there. So I usually set the material to steel, but I set partial matches to on, and the reason is because if I don't make the item out of steel, like say I get it out of bronze for example, my dwarves will take the bronze and use it even though it's not a perfect match rather than go unarmored. The slopes near my bridge are actually going to be removed. I haven't gotten to it yet, but thank you for asking because that is correct. I don't want them there. So now we do a big global remove all of the ramps as though I was really going to remove them all. And then we'll go back and unremove the ones for the ponds and inside the walls so that they're not trying to remove our staircases. And then we will remove the order for the ramp right there to give people a method to get out of the pit if they get in. And we want to remove these natural ramps from over here as well. And that will get rid of the issue where things can climb around just outside our moat. Hmm. 
Now, see, what worries me about this is every time I see that, I freak out and remember that episode that I did where the wildfire swept out of the volcano and nearly killed all my dwarves. And it's nothing. It's just the leaves falling. All right, so let's talk about those stockpiles for a minute. We'll do custom settings, and we'll basically block everything. I want nothing there. Okay, so these stockpiles hold nothing at all. And then we will designate a stockpile space around the outside of, as big as we can, three wide or four wide back, around the outside of our fort to keep trees back even that much further. I think I may go wider than we are, actually. I think I'm going to go on the two outside that, because trees 7x7, seven seven, I don't want them anywhere near my walls. I want to make sure that even if Toadie changes the way jumpers work, that I'm not going to get into a situation where the jumpers are now suddenly close enough to my walls to make the jump. I want them trying to catapult themselves across a chasm. Toadie adds the first siege engine, the, the goblin pult. Now, none of those stockpiles will actually be used to store anything, but they'll basically take up the space. If Toady ever makes falling leaves have effects like evil dust, you uh, might as well give up settling in an evil terrain on the surface at all. At that point, I, I seriously think your evil embark would come down to embark with the materials to build a wooden cabin all the way around your dwarves and seal the door and get below ground with your wagon already indoors. <laughs> yeah, see, I don't want to see that because fortifications really, realistically shouldn't be allowed to be permeable to a creature unless it's small. I mean, you're talking about arrow slits, basically. You know, if a dwarven arrow slit, if a dwarf can't climb through it, then why would a goblin? It's frigid chill. Keep fires hot and eat your fill. You don't need a kennel in V40. If the kennel... I, I haven't even checked if the kennel is still there. Apparently the kennel does nothing. It is a useless building. It is the zone and the labor and that is all. Now, what we will do is tinker just a little here. I need a little more wall outside my area. I want to build back a hair here because I want to have goblins able to come in this way right along the edge of the moat on both sides, but I want to have the caravan know that it needs to take a longer route. So we're going to build some walls that will go out this way. And then I'll have to capstone those walls with another wall that goes up and down and a slight piercing in it. And I'll have to bend the outer edges back a little bit in order to force the caravan, in order to kind of shield the shortest path from the caravan. And the goblins basically will wrap around and they'll try to path next to the moat. And that's where I'll have the traps, is right along the edge of the moat. I did not upload the map, but 
you can look at my world, Jen, and go back to the first episode and see exactly where I embarked. I did upload the map seed. Yeah, they've got to be trained in a zone. It's not just anywhere. And training, if, you've, if you're not familiar with that already, because that was changed in V34, then in addition to that, there's now an additional method for how you have to train wild animals, for example, if you want to domesticate them. Well, not even Dragon, Hydra, and Rock. Uh, an earlier fortress, I captured wild boars. Wild boars are basically giant pigs. Uh, not fully giant, but you get what I'm saying. They're bigger than the real thing. Um, they're, they're, if I recall correctly, they're actually bigger than the standard pigs you can embark with. But you get your first pair, and I happen to catch a male and a female, and you can basically train them, tame them. And when the children are born, you train those, and you can get to the point where they're basically domesticated. Now, I don't know how it's changed in V40. Supposedly, it's going to be possible for that domestication information to cross back into your civilization so that later on you can embark with wild boars because your civilization now knows how to, now knows how to tame them. Not promising that's in 40, mind you. Yeah, the YouTube link out there will take you to past episodes. These will be posted out there at some point. Oh, I know what's taking so long. We did get all our bars moved inside, didn't we? Let's temporarily put some bars right here. Create a stockpile. We'll set it to take bins. We'll set it so it only takes metal bars. We'll block everything else. We'll permit metal bars in bins. And we'll take from our catch-all emergency stockpile down here. And that'll pull the bins that we care about upstairs, and we'll change the material on what we're bringing up. Since right now the only weaponable material we have is bronze, we'll block all of these and we'll only permit bronze bars. And that'll pull all of our bronze upstairs next to the forge where we're currently working on it. Well, the problem is you can embark with dragons, but I'm guessing the embark points would be absurd. And you have the problem of you have to have children that you train and keep trained while they grow into adults. And dragons take a thousand years to grow up. And you might have to do it more than once. So, FPS death, basically, before you get there. It's possible, but I wouldn't expect anybody to actually do it. Now that we have cave moss, we do need to set some pastures underground. Remember, we've got those animals on the surface, and they haven't spooked recently because we've got the walls kind of keeping most things away. But 
we do need to go ahead and get them underground where they'll be secure and safe from depredation. So we'll go ahead and we'll put all of our grazers into pasture here. So that's anything that grazes. Oop, looks, we've got some animals we picked up that I forgot to check on when we confiscated the caravan. Uh, guinea hen I don't care about yet. Turkeys that can just sit right where they are. The ram. And then I think that's everything that we want to have in here. And they'll come along and they'll station it in here, and that stuff will basically graze itself in here. We won't have to care about it at that point. We can we'll have it available if we need it. And you have to get the grazers out of the cage at some point, or they will literally starve to death. So it's possible that we need to butcher those new arrivals because sheep don't take up as much grazing space as reindeer do, for example. Mechanically, there's no difference between llama wool and sheep wool. Llama are slightly, slightly larger and graze a little bigger. Sheep are small and provide everything that llamas do with respect to wool and milk. So, I don't have any use for them. Um, guinea hens, although they're, uh, they're basically just birds like turkeys, you could braise them in addition to turkeys if you wanted variety. Our dwarves will have a sufficient variety based on plants and plant processing in addition to the meats that we get from trading. Yeah, generally I don't actually assign the animals. Training them actually will cause a hit in a dwarf if they die, but if you assign them it's even worse basically because they they form a bond with the dwarf. Spreading out the training a little bit will minimize that to an extent. Depends on what you want them for. Oh, see there, the, the sheep died. Probably starved to death right around the same time we... Oh no, mangled corpse, that's interesting. Fell down the stairs, maybe? Hmm. Looks like it fell down the stairs. That's the only explanation I can give for that. Well, time to talk about garbage and miasma, I guess. Um, so, here's our butcher's workshop, right? Well, that produces all sorts of nasty, unpleasant animal byproducts that we don't care about. And the way we get rid of those is to dig a small diagonal niche in the wall. Remember, it's diagonal. You don't want to dig across. You want you want this to be a corner-to-corner -corner thing. And then we'll designate a zone over that and set it for garbage. And now we can dump anything we like, and it will fall into the hole, and the miasma will be contained, and the dwarves won't have to deal with the smell. Take a look and see what everybody's doing here. Our military is training, but I need their schedule so they train better. Um, our miners need something to do. Our stone worker needs something to do. Did he cancel all his jobs, or did he actually use up all the stone? That's probably what it was. It removed all the stone at some point when we were going along because we actually carved up so much of it. We do want to make some querns because I'll use them for milling. And let's see, we want to go back to making tables and chairs on repeat. And cabinets and coffers on repeat. And I want to make hatch covers for our surface layer, if nothing else. 
And that'll get our mason busy. Now, let's see what else we got here. Miners. Okay, so time to start excavating downward again. Not a dog, it's my wife sneezing in the background. And she says thank you. Yes, but if I recall correctly, turkeys both give more meat and other products, as well as more eggs. So for food, turkeys are superior. For leather, you're probably better off with the peahens if they provide skins. Alright, so now let's start talking about crafts, because now it's about time for us to start talking about how we're going to produce the wealth of the ages. And the answer is, we are going to produce goblets and mugs. And we're going to produce them in large quantity. Not because goblins and mugs are the most valuable things we can produce, but simply because they are easy to produce, and they can be produced en masse. And then we will encrust them with gems and glass, which we will produce en masse. So we'll end up with a situation where we will make glass goblets and encrust them with glass, and we'll be basically producing wealth out of thin air. The sand will be coming from on site, which is an infinite supply, and the magma forges will handle the rest. We'll actually set up um, a minecart route which will bring down sandbags and a second route which will bring up the goblets and basically dump them right next to the depot. Yeah, we won't be doing anything super complicated, but we will be doing a uh, minecart route for this because what we're going to run into, and we may do it for more than just we may do it for more than just sandbags. We may do it for logs as well in order to get um, fuel down to the basement. We can either do it as charcoal or we can do it as logs. Either way, that's right. Baubles for the tourists. But yeah, you know, all our forges are going to have to be low in the world, basically, because we don't have a volcano. So no, you know, first story forging on magma. Well, and the other advantage to producing glass crafts is uh, that we'll actually be able to, have to do something with a slightly greater value than most stone. Now, later on, we'll go back the other direction because we'll take uh, and build an obsidian caster. And we'll harvest obsidian, basically, at that point, which is more valuable than the glass.
Yes, our dining rooms are set as a as a uh, room. We're good. In fact, we've actually reserved a floor up here for use as a uh, mist generator. And we got to get rid of this corpse because it will start to stink the place up. And the dwarves will come along and they will throw it. They will walk it up to this place. They will stand here and they will pitch it into the adjacent hole where it will fall to the floor below. And I want to remove that ramp because I don't want anybody trying to go up to the... I don't want them to try and go up through the, through the dump hole to get to the spot where they throw it down the hole because then we'll get dwarves coming up from below and they'll get hit. Now, I don't have the dining room set as a meeting hall yet, so no parties. Not this early. Uh, it's, detri it's entirely detrimental. I want them not partying yet. Okay, so we talked about military. Let's talk about scheduling. Scheduling is a tricky thing, and there's a way to make it work better. And actually, let's do one other thing. First, let's name these squads. Now, for this one, basically, I don't care. This this first squad, there's only one guy in it, and he can go train whenever he feels like it. Um, we'll leave him right where he's at. He'll never actually be activated as a squad in the first place. But this other squad will be activated, and they will be training, and I want to make sure that they do it in as the most effective way possible. And it turns out that the default order here is not actually really the best way you can do this. Uh, the way you do it is to give another order and pick which order you want to give them and set it for the minimum number of soldiers plus one, which is two. And then change this base order to what it is, but change it down to two as well. And then do the same thing, creating five of these orders on this one month. And the reason you're doing this is because what your dwarves will do is they'll split up into pairs to train, which will eventually get them to the point where their skills are equivalent and they'll start sparring. Sparring gives much, 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 much faster experience than the uh, demonstrations that dwarves do when they don't have any skill whatsoever or no skills in parity. So this will allow you to quickly get your dwarves into parity and then once they're in parity, they'll really take off and they'll start to develop their skills on their own through sparring. Now once I've created that order, keep in mind, that's just for one month, so when I go to the next month, it's gone. Make sure you copy that order and paste it into all the slots. And now, when I activate this squad for training, they're going to get split into squads of two and start working. Which, in fact, is what I want to happen right now. So, unfortunately, this will kind of un make them unhappy in the current version if it hasn't been fixed yet. I think they fixed it. But I think Tony fixed it, but I'm not sure. Gotta go back and look at the... Uh, gotta go back and look at the patch notes, so to speak. I can't remember if uh, it makes them prefer wrestling or not. We'll see. If it does, then frankly the military is completely broken in 4005, and this is going to make a really lousy tutorial for it. I don't remember if did that get fixed in 4004 or 4005. Or is it for the next version? We pull up the patch notes here.
yeah, so there you go. There's the people with a weapon should use it with the proper frequency was fixed on 720. And that's prior to 4005. So that bug is theoretically squashed. So training session right there. Those two guys are going to go actually spar with one another, at least in theory, I think. Either that or they're doing one-on-one -on -one training and that's the only way they get it. That's a new one. don't know that I've seen training session as an order before, as a job before. Oh, I do need to check and make sure that everybody's assigned their proper equipment, though. And they weren't, lol. So this guy, we're going to make him an archer for now. He can go grab the only ranged weapons we have would be a crossbow at this point, so he can grab whatever we've got. In fact, I'll get somebody to make him a crossbow while we're at it. We'll temporarily build ourselves a little bowyer's workshop. We'll build one wooden crossbow and let him go on his merry way. We'll even get the carpenter to do it. And we've just run out of bronze, so at that point all of our bronze is used up, and we can get rid of that, that temporary stockpile we created. We can close down our metalsmith's forge on the surface, we can close down our smelter, they no longer contain anything of value for us that we don't want to move below ground, and we'll disassemble our carpenter's workshop and bowyer's workshop and start putting that, that as will be our first industry down here. So down at the bottom, we started excavating surfaces, and I believe I put craft storage workshop. The next thing we'll put up will be wood. And this won't take our dwarves long to mine out. So we'll get our wood stockpile on the surface, and it'll feed a stockpile down here in the depths. And here we'll put wood furnaces and bowyer workshops and asheries and anything that'll use logs, basically, right here. And, as it happens, because this is where our wood stockpile is, this will eventually become the basis for our tree farm. So we'll go over this way, and we'll go up floors from that to get an open space in which we will dig the new trees. Shouldn't have actually stripped, but he might have replaced an item. Shouldn't have done it near the door, though. And we need to do something about those birds, so that's our next step. We'll take ourselves a small little niche over here. And this will hold all of our birds for us.
See, that's the beautiful thing. You're still going to build a tree farm. You're just going to have to excavate more terrain to get one now. So you'll get these giant open caverns you're basically going to create, or you're going to have to wall off a chunk of the caverns for your own use. And we need to get our doing of get a doing of a bit more brewing because we started to run a little low on booze again. Down to hundred units. I won't miss having to micromanage that once DF hack allows me to reinstall workflow. Okay, and here's where we'll stick all of our wood processing facilities. Mine workers still need something to do, so let's get them busy again. And we'll throw up a temporary wood or a metal working area here. So far, I think the only stones we've really hit have been copper, and I think we hit tetra here somewhere. And we didn't hit this high. There's cassiterite, so that's tin. If we have tetrahedrite at some point down here, then that would be bronze. So far, it looks like only Cassiterite, though. That's kind of a bummer. I was hoping we had Tetrahedrites in there. It's only a tin. That's good. May have got unlucky with our choice of Embark and not had any uh, good metals, if you will. Hmm, not looking promising. What would we set our mineral scarcity to? Do a little exploratory mining here.
Looking like a lot of tin. We may be stuck with wooden traps until we can get better materials. won't work. Okay, well, the good news is there's water here. That means we can build a well. Chances are very good that it sails off the edge of the map, which would make it effectively infinite. That'd be good. So what we'll do is we'll figure out how to rig up the hookup to this cavern. Now, that does mean these bedrooms are going to have to go because they are totally in the wrong place now. So everything in the south gone. And half of the eastern and western. So this is about 110 beds now. Which means we'll need a second bedroom layer. Identical, right below it. So let's go ahead and undesignate this and put our spot back on the middle. Pull quick fork back up. Alt H will pull up the uh, tooltip. Alt F, pick file, 
We'll go into bedrooms. We'll go down to the 224 housing by marble dice that we had before. We'll open it up and we'll say, hey, the blueprint starts you off in the middle at 31 by 31. Bing, bing. And then we'll say OK and we'll hit Alt D. This will dig out um, a chunk of terrain that we care about and a chunk of terrain that we don't. And we'll simply go back and remove all the stuff that would intersect the, ca the uh, caverns. And so we don't want them actually digging it yet. We'll get rid of that. And then we'll get rid of everything south of the main corridor. And then we have 200 plus floors or 200 plus bedrooms for all of our dwarves. This is more than we actually would need. Now, there are no promises, of course, that we don't hit a cave on the other side, but probably not likely. It does mean that some of those areas that we were looking at before we aren't going to mine out because like that floor there would expose us where we don't want to be. Now what we may look at doing is walling off chunks of this terrain for ourselves. It looks like for example that this pit downward here kinda leads into a dead end so we could wall off this chunk of cavern here and basically have it for ourselves. Um, the problem is, is with this water this close, there's no way to really secure the under surface. Things can swim in. So, that's not perfect. Let's see what else we can do here. Looks like that goes down a ways. That uh, goes back up the other side too, and that's a problem. Okay, so walling that off is probably not practical in the short term. Let's see. Oh, and of course, exposing ourselves to this cave would be bad news. That's where the serpent men are hiding, concealing their blowguns with toxic, toxic darts. Well, let's see. We'll penetrate the caverns a different way, then. Right now, that'll do. And I need more mechanisms before I can actually hook the lever to the bridge, which we forgot to do. That's not good. I need to get some mechanisms made so I can get that bridge to where we can actually lift it. Yeah, see, no, I've got um, plurals. Plurals. But it may not be the kinds we like. <laughs> it's possible to have multiple medals and still not get any you care about. Gold is pretty and it will buy a lot of things, but that's the problem, is, is that we won't be able to buy the ore as quickly as we can use it. And so far, our exploratory mining has turned up a whole lot of nothing. So we may have to get deep and hope that there's ore down deeper that we care about, because tin is nice, but without copper it's not going to do us a squat worth of good.
Well, if all we have is tin, then we'll be trading for iron and copper in all of its forms, and then we'll make a combination of bronze and iron to get equipped with. Not ideal, but better than nothing. Actually, with four dwarves, and with actually only four dwarves in the military that we actually care about, let's see what the equipment they've got actually is. He's fully equipped, and it looks like all of my military dwarves are fully equipped with the appropriate armor in bronze, mind you. And that won't last for long, we've only got four of them. And they're all doing their training, which is good. Can I add the woodworker to the squad? thinks the woodworker's in the squad. That's interesting. Wondering if maybe Therapist has caused us an issue here. Let's see if we can't get him out, though. Can I actually name him wrong? I don't actually want my woodworker training, I want him doing things. Somehow we got him convinced he was in a squad that I didn't have him assigned to, didn't think I had him assigned to, and didn't show him having assigned to it. I'll put away his gear and then get back to work. Good. Okay. Let's see what we're missing here. Mine workers need something to do. Haulers are sitting idle. Haulers sitting idle is a good sign that we need to start thinking about cranking out some wealth. Let's see. Considerite. Probably across the board, it looks like. Somebody said they didn't see any other ores in the cavern either. I haven't seen any myself. That's a lot of tin. Without copper, it isn't worth a fig. Well, okay, let's do this a little differently then. Oh, looky there, we found Magnetite. That's nice. For those of you who don't know, Magnetite is an ore of iron. Which means we have found iron. Iron plus 
coal or charcoal gives us steel, which means we will now be able to commence steel making. And magnetite comes in both veins and clusters, if I recall correctly, so this may be a vein or it may be a much, much bigger find. That's a cluster. That's nice. And that ought to pretty well get it dug out. And the find of iron ore means we can now make anvils and actually get a real metalworking industry started. So, let's go see what we got here. Wood industry will be on that floor. Let's do metalworking right here for now. We'll start with a single metalsmith's forge, which will basically take our original anvil and move it down here. And then we'll set up additional if we have any additional anvils, we'll set up additional ones with the anvils we stole, for example, from the caravan. And now we'll do uh, smelters. And we'll have one for melting things and one or two for cranking out iron or steel. We will do glass only once we get access to either a larger source of fuel than we currently have, or to magma. It might. So that'll be the next place I look, will be right above and below this, just to see. Below might be... no, nope, below's the same stone, so we're in good shape there. I'll go below and above just to see. But that'll get us a nice supply of iron to get us started, at least. Well, 19 is probably all we're going to get tonight, because it's just about time for me to knock off. We've only got 19 dwarves at the moment. But that's about time for me to get done, so... We'll run a little longer, but not too much. Chances are good. Let's see what time, what, 
how late are we? It's late winter, so we might get one more migration wave, maybe. And it looks like the cluster above it is going to be microcline, so no, we don't cross over between Z levels up. And probably not been flip by going down either. We'll look. There, too. Sure enough. And now we need some stockpiles to handle the materials that these two industries are going to need. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to need stone stockpiles for the smelters. So let's go ahead and designate that. And the stone we want in this case is just one metal ore, i.e. magnetite. Because we want iron and all the iron to be stored here. We'll assign it wheelbarrows. Now, you may remember we didn't actually make any wheelbarrows at the start. We didn't need them right away. Well, that time has come. So, wheelbarrows it is. We'll make a few of those. And now that I have all these workshops designated and set in, basically, I can come in here and do this. Make this into a wood stockpile. And they'll haul the wood down here from the surface. Relocate the puppies to slightly safer pasture. Yeah, magnetite in a cluster is an enormous find for a fortress, especially early on. When Now the catch is, is that digging out the magnetite, because it's iron, is incredibly valuable, so we just created an enormous amount of wealth all at once. Basically that entire pile of stone you see there is all worth like 30 per unit. Platinum would be nice, but I'm not going to sweat it if we don't get it. Now, what we are going to get is our first visit from the Elven Diplomat. We'll talk about diplomacy in the next episode. Anybody have any questions for me before I head out for this evening?
Oh, that's a diss. Picking Sharknado 2 over me? <laughs> uh, next stream will probably be in a couple of days. Hey, no problem, guys. If you've got questions, like I said, don't hesitate to ask. But the whole point is not just me talking. It's actually somebody asking, well, what about X? Because you don't need a danger room. If you set up your military squad correctly, they will get to sparring relatively quickly, and you would be surprised how fast their skills will grow. The catch is, is that you have to get them sparring. If you don't get them sparring, then they're going to sit and do demonstrations. And the skill rate gain on demonstrations is so slow you'll never keep up with the increasing page of your sieges. In order to deal with a military and not have to resort to a danger room, you have to get them sparring. Now, initially it'll be a little slow because Dwarf 1 will learn Biting, for example, at level 0, basically. He'll gain like 35 skill points, and then he'll immediately have to teach everybody else in the squad how to bite. And the next, then the next guy will, you know, swing his axe or his hammer once, and he'll get skill in hammer, you know, up to level zero. And then he immediately has to turn around and do a demonstration because nobody else has skill zero. And that once they get through that, yeah, once you get through that setting where they're just passing the skills around, if you will, then their skills are going to be equal, i.e., bad but equal, and they should start splitting up into uh, pairs better at that point. Initially, there's a delay while your skills propagate around the group. One guy knows biting, he teaches his partner. The next month, his partner teaches somebody else. So it's a little slow to start, but once it gets going, the sparring will really build up your skills quickly. Yeah, I mean, you can ask some of the folks who've been around for prior streams. It, once you get the schedule set right, and that's admittedly in version 34, it's possible to broke in here, don't quote me. But once you get it set up correctly and you get them sparring, psh, they just, they take off. It's done. You basically set them out front, you know, put a few traps out in front of them, and then set them out front, and sieges come in, get weakened by the traps, and then just get mauled by your military. Our third migration wave will be relatively minor. If we haven't seen another siege or ambush by summer, though, we're going to start getting larger waves, and we'll, our military will go up in size dramatically over the next few episodes. With the way the new sieges are working, with the way the new invasions are working, I don't see any, re I don't see any solution, basically, to building up your military basically as fast as you can. Yeah, I mean, when we did the Desert Fortress, um, admittedly the traps weakened a bunch of them, but we basically we basically had a squad of legendary dwarves a couple of years in. Because once they get to sparring, they just keep sparring, and they keep sparring, and they're sparring the whole time. And so their skill rate gain is just incredible. The catch is, is that the default schedule is worthless for getting them to do anything. Because if they don't have ten people, they just basically stand around. So you have to change that order. The, the default is just, it's awful. It's horrible. Anybody else have anything else? Yeah, the entire purpose is to get them to break up into groups of two. 
at which point they'll spar and part they'll, they'll have a sparring partner basically if they're not exactly equal so there's some small delay you know say around the cusps of skill levels where some guys in the squad are skill level four and some of them are skill level three and they'll kind of do a little bit of demonstrating get them across that threshold sometimes but a lot of times they'll just rocket past the boundary points in a, in a single sparring session for example I'm going to go out, see, this isn't going to be the final tutorial I do for V40 because DF Hack isn't out yet. So, you know, in addition to any changes that Toadie might make between now and the final version for version 40, uh, DF Hack is something I've always included in my tutorials. This is just a, a placeholder, if you will, before I come back and do it again with DF Hack in, in tow. And I'll keep this for purposes of comparison to the other one, because a lot of the things that we did in this fort are going to be done much more simply in uh, in a DF hack enabled fort, was simply by virtue of the automation tools that we'll have access to. Really cuts down on the micromanagement. In fact, with the new wood uh, amounts and workflow, I foresee being able to run your your smelters basically purely off the wood. We'll we'll make a good go at it here just with doing repeat orders, but workflow with a with a wood industry will be amazing. Guarantee you have a hundred units of coal on site at all times by queuing up log burning jobs, you know. At some point, I'll start going through worlds and advanced world gen. Keep in mind, we used a small world this time because I'm not sure all of the performance issues with larger worlds are fixed yet. We'll go through in, in some hypothetical final version of the V40 tutorial. I'll be hunting for a flat map with sand and a volcano and iron and flux just to demonstrate all of the basic industries that I care about for offense and defense, if you will. At that point, we'll be able to go straight to steel and glass and obsidian. Ideally, we'll catch one of those that's near a tower, like we did with our tutorial fort, where we could run it for a different amount of time and get a tower. It'd be nice to be able to have a tower neighbor that's optional. Okay, guys, that's it for me tonight. Doesn't look like anybody else has any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. Thanks for watching. I'll post again in this DF subreddit when it's time for me to do another stream, probably in a couple days. Have a good night.